So if we just wrap up a little bit about what makes the ocean salty, the short answer to that is anything that dissolves in water. So although salt makes up the bulk of what we can think of as the salt water, it contains just about every element known to man, at least all naturally occurring elements. So what makes salter, what makes seawater salty are the elements dissolved in it. Sodium chloride and those major constituents and those minor constituents, trace elements, the biologically important nutrients that we talked about, and even the dissolved organic matter. That all makes seawater salty or what we taste or perceive as salty. So in measuring the saltiness, we use electronically this principle of conductivity and it's in using and determining the saltiness or salinity of the world ocean that we learn a lot about where organisms can live and also learn something about ocean circulation as we'll see later. Okay, we've already gone through this once but we want to talk a little bit more about the hydrologic cycle because ultimately it's a hydrologic cycle that's getting those salts into the world ocean. It's interactions between the two spheres that we talked about earlier, the geosphere and the hydrosphere, that over geologic time scales govern, really control the salinity of the world ocean. As rocks break down, certain elements, certain compounds in rocks, including salts, also are dissolved into the water. And as hydrothermal vents circulate seawater, they supply salts and other elements to seawater. So it's the chemical breakdown of rocks, the hydrothermal processes that are going on at oceanic ridges in the ocean that supply salt to the ocean over geologic timescales. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of years, maybe tens, but hundreds of thousands of years and long time scales determine ultimately the kinds of salts we find in the ocean. Well, getting rid of those salts isn't a process that we think of very intuitively, but as it turns out, as continents move about, and we talked about plate tectonics earlier, as shorelines are lifted up and water gets trapped, sometimes beyond the shoreline, that water evaporates and it leaves salts behind. And as you may or may not have discovered, sea salt is rapidly becoming a desired gourmet product in grocery stores all over. And here's a, a one on the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa where large salt deposits are now being mined and put in bags and those salts can be shipped off and put in little bottles and made into uh, a product for people to season their food. In some cases, sea salts are even used for sprinkling on roads, icy roads, and reducing the hazard that way. But it's those evaporation ponds and those tectonic processes that trap salts that remove salt from the world ocean. Well, here's just a, a brief reminder of the hydrologic cycle, which is important to this. Water evaporates over the ocean. It condenses as clouds. It may then condense even further and precipitate into rainfall, which then through the action of gravity, carries any dissolved elements into the ocean. So here we have both evaporation, which leaves the salts behind in the ocean if the water evaporates uh, in the ocean, which would increase the salinity. And also we have dilute salts that are being brought into the ocean through surface runoff. Okay, so let's look a little bit about how that hydrologic cycle might change the salinity of the ocean. What's regulating ocean salinity? Well, as I said earlier, and as we saw the picture of the two guys filling up bags of salt, evaporation leaves the salts behind. Now, if that evaporation happens in seawater, those salts are left behind in seawater and it makes the water saltier. Okay, that should make some sense to you. Precipitation, and in this case, we're talking about rainfall, that adds fresh water to the ocean. So that will decrease the salinity. These are two processes that happen every day. These are very short time scale processes. We just looked at runoff and weathering and hydrothermal vents, as well as evaporite ponds as being long-term processes. 
These are short-term processes that change the salinity of the surface waters of the world ocean on daily to weekly time scales. We probably don't think about it much, but sea ice that forms actually leaves salts behind. It's called salt rejection or brine rejection, and those salts being left behind increase the salinity in the region where the ice formed. The opposite of that, of course, is when ice melts and adds that fresh water back to the ocean and decreases the salinity. Now, I hope you'll take a few minutes, and there's a figure in the book we'll talk about in just a second, to think about this because it's these local changes in seawater salinity that drive ocean circulation and determine where organisms may even be found. Okay, well I hope you have some understanding of where salts come from and maybe some vague idea of how salts might be controlled in the ocean and I hope you have some idea of the importance of biologically important nutrients for the growth of phytoplankton and maybe some vague idea of how we measure saltiness in the ocean and we'll start to put some of these ideas together when we talk about ocean physics and talk about ocean circulation and air-sea interactions and those kinds of things but for the most part just try to develop some familiarity with these uh, terms and with the, the kinds of concepts that relate to ocean chemistry and you'll be fine as we move on into our later chapters. Now the last part of this chapter where we talk about human impacts I'm going to cover in a special lecture uh, and go into a little bit more detail. So for now just study what we've uh, covered in this lecture and those relevant parts in the book and if you want to know more feel free to check out the exploration activities, uh, the carbon cycle, as well as some of the resources and when we get to talking more about human impacts on the world ocean, uh, you'll want to check out some of these videos. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.